The origins of The Legend of Zelda goes all the way back to 1984, when Nintendo was experiencing massive success with their very first home console, the Famicom, better known as the NES outside of Japan. To capitalize on its popularity, Nintendo started looking for a way to create bigger and better games without having to introduce a brand new console. They quickly found their solution while looking into the home computer market. Floppy disks were quickly becoming the new standard for storing data, and provided twice the storage space compared to cartridges at the time. Additionally, they were cheaper to produce, offered better sound quality, and allowed players to save their game directly onto the disc, a big step forward from having to rely on writing down passwords. The Japanese company therefore decided to create their own version of the floppy disk and named it Discard. Famicom consoles of course weren't compatible with this new media format, so Nintendo started developing an add-on called the Famicom Disk System. This way, the millions of people that already owned the base console could simply upgrade it and enjoy the new exclusive games. Nintendo knew they had to develop a flagship title that could showcase the Disk System's capabilities, and to accomplish this, the company looked towards one of their most talented developers, Shigeru Miyamoto, who had recently proven himself by directing the Donkey Kong arcade games. Miyamoto agreed to help create the Disk System's flagship title and teamed up with designer Takashi Tezuka. They were the only designers on the team and produced all the sketches, concept art and pixel art. Shortly after starting development on Zelda, both Miyamoto and Tezuka also began to work on Super Mario Bros. The main inspiration for The Legend of Zelda came from the idea of capturing the essence of what it's like to go on an adventure, something Miyamoto remembers very well from his childhood. As with the Mario series, I came up with the concept for the Zelda series from my adventures as a child exploring the wide variety of places around my home. There were plenty of caves and mountains. We didn't have that many toys to play with, so I would make slingshots or use sticks and twigs to make puppets and keep myself amused. When I traveled around the country without a map, trying to find my way, stumbling on amazing things as I went, I realized how it felt to go on an adventure like this. The official design documents were aptly codenamed Adventure Title. Miyamoto's and Tezuka's first idea for a premise involved the game's setting to be split between the future and the past. The team even imagined the fragments of the Triforce's electronic microchips in order to better fit the technologically advanced futuristic setting. The player would be able to time travel and serve as the link between both time periods, which is why they named the main character Link. However, seeing Tezuka was a huge fan of fantasy books, especially The Lord of the Rings, the premise and setting began to lean towards something more medieval inspired. The first iteration of the actual gameplay involved a two-player mode, where each player had to design their own labyrinth. Once completed, they could explore each other's creation. After creating a prototype, Miyamoto and Tezuka agreed that the exploration aspect was a lot more fun than the building aspect. As a result, they shifted their focus towards creating a more puzzle-oriented exploration game. The second iteration more closely resembled the final product, although there was no overworld yet. Instead, players had to select a stage through a first-person perspective and would instantly enter it. Miyamoto made a sketch of this concept and an in-engine mockup was even developed using Family Basic, a consumer product that made it possible to create small programs and games for the Famicom. Miyamoto later confirmed the first-person view was directly inspired by games like the Black Onyx and Ultima. Before we move on, I'd like to talk about this video sponsor, Raycom, a brand that's all about designing premium wireless audio products for an affordable price. Back in 2017, co-founders Ray J and Ray Lee were frustrated with the audio space. High prices, confusing specs and poor product designs made quality audio devices inaccessible for many people. In October 2017, Ray J and Ray Lee took matters into their own hands and started Raycon. Ray J's experience in the music industry combined with Ray Lee's history and consumer electronics led to a brand that embraces and empowers the everyday individual. The company doesn't outsource any of the design and development of their earbuds, and instead their small but mighty team of audio engineers create products worthy of competing with other industry giants and then some. What I personally love about Raycon's earbuds is how light, comfortable and user-friendly they are, perfect for when I'm commuting on the train, cleaning around the house or going on a walk. Despite their small size, they still provide excellent sound quality 
and the noise isolation mode makes noisy train rides much more enjoyable. Thanks to the earbuds 8 hours of playtime plus an additional 32 hours of battery provided by the charging case, they're ideal for everyday use. Furthermore, the highly competitive price point makes them very easy to recommend to just about everyone. Click the link in the description or go to buyraycon.com slash thatguyglenn to get 15% off your Raycon purchase today. Raycon, power up your everyday. Now back to the video. As evident from early concept art, players were originally meant to mainly explore cave-like areas, which, as mentioned before, originated from Miyamoto's childhood memories when he ventured into many caves in the wider Kyoto region. Early on during development, it was decided that the game mechanics needed to be the polar opposite of those of Super Mario Bros. Mario was all about getting from point A to point B in a very linear fashion, and mostly required good reflexes. In The Legend of Zelda, Miyamoto wanted players to think about where to go next and not hold their hand throughout the whole experience. This is one of the main reasons why the team abandoned the idea of selecting a stage from a title screen and instead opted to create a big overworld that connects all areas. Miyamoto wanted the game to feel like a quote, miniature garden that players can put inside their drawer, and really emphasize the sense of going on a big adventure with endless possibilities. This new direction did make the team very nervous as they were afraid gamers would quickly become bored and stressed out from the game not telling them where to go or what to do. The new overworld inspired the developers to design more than just caves and also add proper dungeons to the mix. The dungeon designs were once again inspired by Miyamoto's childhood, specifically his family home in Sonobe and remembers it as being quote, a maze of sliding doors that he frequently got lost in. Another good example of not holding the player's hand are some of the original designs where every player starts their journey with the sword already in their inventory. When Miyamoto saw these designs, he decided against it and instead came up with the idea of having to find and talk to the old man NPC, who only then gives you the sword. More of these sort of riddles and puzzles were added to the game, and while the team realized not every player might pick up on every clue and find every secret, they thought it might encourage people to share their discoveries with friends and help them progress. Since both The Legend of Zelda and Super Mario Bros. were being developed simultaneously, Miyamoto found himself labeling older ideas and concepts as either Mario ideas or Zelda ideas. There was only one idea that was shared between both games, to place less value on earning a high score, which was very popular popular at the time thanks to arcade machines, and instead offer more incentives to simply complete the game. While Miyamoto and Tezuka had moved on from the time travel concept, they kept the name Link for the player character, although the meaning behind it had changed. Link needed to increase immersion and connect or link players with the game. Miyamoto wanted there to be a strong relationship between the one who holds the controller and the person who is on the screen. This is why the hero of Hyrule starts out as an ordinary young boy, as a way for the target audience to connect more closely to the main character's coming of age tale. It's also for this reason that Link never speaks in The Legend of Zelda. Miyamoto wanted players to be able to feel as if they were Link, and having a speaking protagonist would break this illusion. Even with the increased storage space of the Famicom Disk System, Miyamoto and Tezuka were still very limited in regards to the use of colors and the amount of pixels for a single character. For instance, either Link's shield or sword are always visible, and they gave him big ears and a long hat to make him stand out from the background. It reminded them of a fairy character, so they went in the direction of an elf. Miyamoto, being a big Disney fan, also took some inspiration from Peter Pan, specifically his green outfit. In early art examples, Link was depicted as being right-handed, but in order to aid in the creation of the pixel art, he was altered to be left-handed. The idea for Princess Zelda, on the other hand, came from someone unexpected. Miyamoto knew he wanted the title to be The Legend of Something, but he had a hard time figuring out what that something should be. That's when the game's PR planner said, why don't you make a storybook for this game? He suggested an illustrated story where Link rescues a princess who is a timeless beauty with classic appeal, and mentioned famous author F. Scott Fitzgerald, whose wife's name is Zelda. The PR planner suggested giving the princess that name, and Miyamoto ended up really liking it. The storybook idea would later take the shape of the game's detailed instruction manual. Nintendo enlisted the help of Keiji Terui, a screenwriter who's worked on animated shows like Dragon Ball. He wrote the backstory for the game's characters and the land of Hyrule, which was all included in the manual along with some artwork. Miyamoto's most important condition was that the story had to be immersive, but also easy to understand. Though he recognized the importance of a great story, he feared a complicated plot could get in the way of the game being straightforward and coherent. 
Teruwi was inspired by medieval European battles while writing the backstory for The Legend of the Triforce. Speaking of the Triforce, while most people associate it with the Zelda series nowadays, the symbol originated almost a thousand years ago in medieval Japan. Around the 12th century, the Hojo clan, a powerful family that took control of Japan using politics, used a similar looking emblem called the Mitsu Uroko, or Three Scales. In the 1800s, the symbol was used as a publisher's seal, and it's currently still a prominent in Japanese graphic design. As the team continued to build the world of Hyrule, Miyamoto and Tezuka started encountering the limitations of the Famicom disc hardware. Despite the best efforts of the team to work around these limitations in creative ways, certain things needed to be scrapped entirely. An example of this is the level 7 dungeon entrance. Initially, the team had intended to have the water physically disappear when it drained from the room. Instead, they had to settle for simply changing the color of the ground. Furthermore, the developers wanted players to not only be able to burn down small trees, but also big ones. The team also encountered obstacles during the creation of the dungeons. Graph paper was used to map out all the dungeons and each square represented one room. Afterwards, the square pieces were laid out like a jigsaw puzzle. Once Tezuka had completed the entire game's map, he handed all the pieces over to programmer Toshihiko Nagago, who then closely recreated the dungeons in the actual game. Unfortunately, Tezuka had made a mistake and only used half of the dungeon pieces while creating the whole map. Luckily, Miyamoto said it looked good as is, and the team decided to use half of the memory that was still left to create the game's second quest, which is unlocked after completing the game. Composer Koji Kondo made sure the game's soundtrack wasn't just pretty, but also evoked a sense of mystery, something Miyamoto requested. Unfortunately, something so bad happened with the soundtrack that the developers gave the incident its own name, the copyright incident. For most of the game's development duration, Kondo used Maurice Ravel's musical piece Bolero for the title screen, because it perfectly matched with the speed of the opening crawl. In Japan, music usually enters the public domain 50 years after the death of the composer, and the team was sure they could use Ravel's music by now. However, just before the game was finished and was set to go into production, they found out that it had been 49 years and 11 months since Ravel's death. With the copyright still intact, Kondo had exactly one day to replace it with something new. He ended up writing a new arrangement of the overworld theme overnight, which ended up becoming the iconic motif echoing throughout the entire Zelda franchise. The team ended up working simultaneously on Mario and Zelda for about 7 months, which made for a very busy development journey. Miyamoto and Tezuka asked the Mario programmers to join them for The Legend of Zelda in a final programming sprint, which Miyamoto admitted was very intense. During the entire development process of The Legend of Zelda, the game was never beta tested by players. Miyamoto preferred to determine himself whether or not the game worked, reasoning that if he enjoyed it, others would too. Miyamoto wanted players to experience Kyokan, for the players to feel about the game what the developers felt themselves while developing it. In February 1986, after two years of development, The Legend of Zelda was released in Japan. It received very positive reviews from critics and sold 1 million copies on its first day of release. A total of 1.69 million copies were sold in Japan alone. When the time came to release The Legend of Zelda on the NES, it was no longer necessary to create its own disc system add-on. Not long after the release of the Famicom disc system, chips and cartridges had become much cheaper to produce, which gave companies the option Option to make cartridges with more memory, as well as built-in battery-powered RAM, making it possible for players to save their progress. Therefore, Zelda could simply be ported to an NES cartridge, although the lack of certain Famicom Disk System features did lead to small differences. For example, due to the NES's lack of an extra sound channel, certain sound effects had to be altered, like Link's sword beam at full health, roars and growls of dungeon bosses and those of defeated enemies. Additionally, the Famicom version took advantage of the system's second controller that comes with a built-in microphone, something the NES controllers did not have. By talking into the controller, you're able to defeat the enemy Paul's voice. In the NES version, they're not so easily defeated. Funnily enough, the English version of the manual wasn't updated to reflect this, and states Paul's voices hate loud noises, causing confusion. Many players assume the recorder item could be used as a way to defeat them. The Legend of Zelda topped the global gaming charts and became the first NES game to sell over 1 million copies in the United States. It went on to sell over 6.5 million units worldwide. Together with Super Mario Bros., The Legend of Zelda helped Nintendo to dominate the console game market, and was re-released many times over for multiple consoles. 
it served as a template for the action role-playing genre and launched one of the biggest franchises in the history of gaming. The first Zelda was even used as inspiration for Breath of the Wild, and the developers went as far as creating a 2D prototype based on the original game and used it to test out ideas for open-world gameplay mechanics. Breath of the Wild's director said he wanted to develop a game where the player could truly experience freedom and a sense of adventure in the land of Hyrule, something that reminded him of Zelda on the NES. The Zelda franchise now counts numerous mainline games and plenty of spin-offs. With Tears of the Kingdom's recent success, the Zelda franchise will undoubtedly continue to make its mark on the gaming industry and fascinate players for many years to come.